So if you grab your Bible and you hold it in your hands and repeat after me, this is my Bible, God's Word written for me. I, ha I am what it says I am, I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Within these pages, I will find strength, peace, and love. Today I will be taught the Word of God. So I boldly and fearlessly confess, my mind is prepared, my heart is receptive, and I will be changed from the inside out. I'm about to receive the everlasting, the unchanging, the ever-living Word of God, and I declare that I will not be the same. Amen. I'm going to begin with some prayer, if you guys would pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let flow your words for your glory and for your purpose. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you've got your Bible, hopefully you can open your Bible up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. That's what we're going to be looking at as we begin this morning. But first, um, you know, there's, there's so many teachers, there's so many different denominations that have begun to move sort of outside of the gospel of Jesus. They've, they've either muddied it up or distorted it in such a way that it is not quite right, <laughs> if that's the best way of saying it. They're watering it down. They're, they're perverting it. They're, um, they're doing things that's making it really hard to, to see and to watch and experience because so many people, they, they see some of that truth, even though it's been watered down and they love it and they enjoy it and it fits them and they don't have to change a lot. It's not challenging them. So they like it. They flock to it, right? Um, there's this one thing that we used to say a lot that, you know, we, we always say just a little bit of poop in the brownie. But if you were to put just a little tiny bit of poop in a batch of brownies and you knew that, would you eat it? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want any of that, right? Um, it probably still tastes fine. You probably wouldn't even know. But there's a little bit of poop in the brownie. You know, there's a back when, when I was doing a lot of testing and stuff. Um, in high school and college, when they would give us true false questions, usually all it takes is changing one little word to make a true statement false, right? The sky is blue. The sky is yellow, right? Uh, just one word, or even just saying the sky is not blue, which could be true sometimes, but not true other times. So um, it's very easy to make a true statement false by just changing a little bit, by watering it down, by moving something around. And that has happening a lot with people who are trying to teach Jesus and the gospel. I'm not going to call out people or denominations or whatever right now, because I don't think that's really the loving approach to do that. Um, but there is a story that Bethany actually originally told me that I find kind of works in this situation. So there's a, there's a banker who dealt with money all the time, right? When you're a, when you're a banker, especially the, the old school years and years ago bankers who always touch money all the time, and a lot of bankers do now still too. But um, before there was a lot of you know cards and checks and things. Cash was the main medium of the currency, and so they dealt with money all the time. They dealt with cash. They felt it. They touched it. Um, day in and day out, they would use this stuff. And so he knew exactly how that money felt, that banker did. He was training his son also to be a banker. And he wanted him to, he didn't want him to fall victim to counterfeit money. He didn't want him to, to accidentally take some counterfeit money and believe that it's real. So instead of teaching him what counterfeit money looked like or felt like, he made his son handle and deal with real money because there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of counterfeit money. A lot of different ways that people can make money counterfeit. It can look very real, it can feel very real, but it may not be real. And, there, and it's, it's almost impossible to try to teach somebody all the little things that make it not real. Um, or, or that uh, counterfeit money is doing. It's a lot easier and better for you to actually handle real money to feel it, to touch it, to look at it, to smell it, whatever it is, when you're handling real money and you know what real money looks like, you know what real money feels like, you know what it smells like, all those things, then you're going to know what real money is. And you'll be able to spot a counterfeit every time because you know what real money 
looks like and feels like. And, and so the banker thought, okay, if I train my son only to deal with real money, that when he runs into counterfeit money, he's going to know it's counterfeit because it doesn't look or feel like real money. And I think this is kind of what Paul wanted for his churches. You know, he wanted them to know and to remember what the real gospel looked like and what it felt like. Right? So I want to go ahead and read to you guys 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it is it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. And so Paul, he's coming to the end of, of this letter to a church that he started. You know, this whole letter, 1 Corinthians, is, is to the church in Corinth. He spent a year and a half in Corinth establishing this church. And now he's advising it as he's traveling around, spreading God's word in other places, other, other countries. He's moving around and he's, he's writing letters to the churches that he'd started, advising them, helping to continue to teach them, and helping them to continue to stay and stead, be steadfast in what Paul had originally brought them, this gospel of Christ. And so throughout the whole letter, he's addressing things with the congregation that have become issues where they were no longer focusing on the gospel. So through the letter, he walks through several topics with the Corinthians. So the good news of Jesus for Paul first was that Jesus unites us because Paul talks often about, you know, whether you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, men or women, we are all united in Christ. It is Jesus who unites us. So that's his first thing. His second thing is that Jesus gives us the motivation to be holy. You know, we do good in response to Christ, right? It's not, it's not that we do good um, in order to earn something. But it's, it's Jesus who gives us that motivation to be good, who gives us the motivation to be holy and to walk a holy life. And so when we, it, that is the good news for Paul is that Jesus motivates us to be good, to, to be holy. The third thing is that Jesus gives us the power to love. Now this one's actually really big because Jesus himself, um, when you go back even to like the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about loving our enemies talks about loving people that maybe we disagree with, loving our neighbors, um, even loving our family and everything else too, but loving people, loving the other over ourselves. And that's huge because it's only by Christ's power that we can do that, I guarantee you, because it's way too easy to love ourselves. We're too selfish, internally motivated, and all those things. We can love ourselves really well. We are not good at loving others, especially when we disagree with them, when we hate them, when there are enemies, when they wish us ill. It's hard to love them. Jesus gives us the power to do that. That's the good news, right? Now, the fourth thing, the most important thing, is that Jesus, remember for Paul, the good news of Jesus was that Jesus is our hope and our assurance of victory over sin and death. And that is the big thing, because without Christ, we have no power over sin and death. And that is what keeps, that is the gap between us and, between us and God. So the good news um, is all those things. This is the good news, right? For Paul, when he shares this with people, this is the good news, that we can have a path to God because of Jesus. And it's not our doing, it's his, right? It's nothing that we can do, it's all about Jesus. 
And so that is the good news, is that we don't have to earn something, that, that Jesus spans that gap. He creates the motivation and um, the power and the, the unity among all of us. And that in that together, he has built a, a bridge that spans the gap between us and God because of our sin, because of our evil nature. And so that's the good news, is that Jesus does that for us. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. It's a gift. But just hearing Paul proclaim this, doesn't, it doesn't really do anything for them. It doesn't do anything for us. Just hearing it, me saying all those things, that doesn't, that's not doing anything um, in itself, right? You just hearing those things, it doesn't actually make anything happen. Now, hearing basically in, in Paul's understanding is not enough, right? Because if it was, how great would it be? I mean, I, I actually wish that hearing was enough. Don't you? Because we could just get like a, a mega speaker on a vehicle. And we could start driving through the neighborhoods in Burley and Rupert and wherever wherever we, we can go. We just get this big speaker up there and, and a microphone inside the car. We could just start reading the book of, of John, you know, the Gospel of John. Just start reading it. Everybody can hear the Gospel. And, and as soon as they hear it, they're saved, right? That would be amazing. That would be awesome. It would make evangelism easy. It would make it, um, I mean, it would be a piece of cake to walk around and just start telling people about Jesus and then they'd be saved. So if hearing was enough, um, that would be easy. But it's not. It's not enough. Paul says also, after saying this is the, the gospel that I proclaim to you, that you heard, he says, which you in turn received. That's the very next thing. Which you in turn received. They received the gospel that Paul shared with them. They received it. It's the receiving that matters, right? I don't know why, um, for some reason, this has been a, a very, a little bit more of a recent problem than it has in the past, but our UPS and our FedEx drivers, they no longer try to get our signatures when they deliver packages to our house. And I, I don't love, you know, when I have to sign for things or have to be here or you know, I've, I've, I remember times when I wasn't here that I needed a signature and I had to go and uh, go to the whatever location to pick up my box and stuff, and it was a hassle. But um, that signature was actually very beneficial, and I didn't realize how beneficial it was until recently because they keep just leaving our stuff at the doors. And we've had packages stolen from our door many times. And I know that that has happened with maybe some of you. It's happened with um, lots of people around the world, especially around Christmas time when packages are being delivered from like Amazon and stuff like crazy. And in fact, there was uh, a guy named Mark Rober who put together, he was tired of this happening too, right? He had this happen. He's a NASA engineer and does a YouTube channel now. You can easily find him and check him out. But he put a uh, he made a package that had glitter in the top with a little spinner on it, and then phones all around it so he could capture on video. And he would he put this package on his front door, wait for somebody to come and steal it, and and as soon as they they would um, move it around, the cameras would turn on and activate, right? So then he would take this package would and on, and he has on his channel he has the the video of this happening, and they would lift up the package, and the glitter would just go. Whoosh, spin it would spin on the thing and spray everywhere and it would all be on video and usually and oh yeah and he had a little uh fart sprayer thing that would squirt it just kept squirting and so it would stink up the car or wherever they were at <laughs> it was actually really great so you'd, he'd open this thing up glitter would spray the fart smell would go everywhere and the theory was that they would it would sort of teach them a lesson, but then they would also just throw the package out the window or whatever or in the trash, and he could go retrieve it. So we actually got to do this like multiple times to different people. Um, it was pretty neat to see and, and, and watch happen because there's no justice in um, packages being stolen. Even when you have it on video, there's nothing that the police can do. Uh, so it's a very, very frustrating thing. So I've had packages stolen at my house, and... The people sent the packages, right? They know they sent it. And the carrier delivered the package to our door. But that doesn't mean that I received the package, right? They, they sent it. The carrier delivered it. They probably set it right on my doorstep. But that doesn't mean that I got it. It doesn't mean that I actually received that package. When you have to sign for the package, 
you're assuring the sender and yourself and even the, the carrier that you received the package. You actually took the package from them. You brought it into your home. You're holding it. You're receiving it into you. You've received the package. You've signed for it. They see the date, the time, and your signature, and they know that you've received the package. There's something similar happening with the gospel. You can hear people tell you about Jesus, but until you actually decide to receive it, it's not salvific, it's not saving until you've actually received that gospel. Same thing with your package. You're not, I mean, you can send the package, you can send me whatever you want, but until I actually receive it, I don't get it. You know? And it's the same thing with the gospel. Now, Paul then says, also, in which you also stand. So he's saying, this is the gospel message, right? He's, pre he's saying, I gave you guys this gospel message. I proclaimed it to you. They heard it from Paul. Then they received it. And now he's saying that they're, they've been standing in it, that they stood in it. They have lived this gospel message out. They've, in, they've implemented it into their life, right? God does not want, or, well, God doesn't either, but Paul in his letter was saying, I don't want you to waver from it. I want you to recognize that this is where you're standing, that you have stood in this message that I proclaim to you, that you received, you've been standing in it. You've been standing steadfast. And it's, it's a call for them, but it's a call for us too, right? That we would continue to stand on the gospel, that we would not waver in that gospel that we have received, that we have heard. And there's, all, there's so much you know, political and cultural pull on us as Christians to basically forsake that gospel. There really is. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, it's been going on for years. Our culture is priming us to be seen as, as people who are, are haters, who are bigots, who are extremists. You know, you put the label on it. Um, that is what the culture is, is priming us to be seen as. And it's simply because we understand that the gospel is good news. And I know that sounds crazy, but because we think the gospel is good news, they think we're extreme. They think we're hating people or we're being bigots or whatever it might be, whatever label you want to put on it, because we see it as good news. And why, why is that crazy? Well, in order for the gospel to be good news, in order for you to understand that Jesus is good news, you have to recognize and you have to identify the bad news, that we're sinners that we're not perfect, that we mess up, that we don't get it right, that what we think and do and everything is not always correct. That's the bad news, right? We have to accept that as bad news. But culture is constantly and consistently telling us that we're not sinners. I know it doesn't sound like you're going to be like, yeah, Pastor Jared, I don't know that they're telling us that. Well, they are. They're telling us that we are not sinners. They're telling us that whatever you think and feel and believe and everything is just fine for you, right? That we're all supposed to recognize the ways that, that all of us think, the, how we feel and behave is just fine for us. It's just fine for us, right? That our understanding of the world is equal to anyone else's and that collectively we know better than God, right? That's what, that's what the culture is telling us, that... Each and every one of us has our own sort of perspective. That perspective is equal to everyone else's. And because it's equal to everyone else's, collectively we have a better perspective and a, and a better understanding of the world than God does in God's word. So to admit that our world is broken and that individually we cannot fully choose what is right apart from God, that's blasphemous in the sight of our culture. Saying that is blasphemous. To say that we admit that our world is broken. I think a lot of people would admit that, but you have to take that to the full degree, right? We have to admit that our world is broken and individually we cannot fully choose what is right. And if we come to that understanding, that's a blasphemous concept to our culture. And that's the direction that, that everything is going. They're priming us to be seen as Haters, bad, extremists, whatever you want to put on it. So standing in the good news was as important for the Corinthians that Paul is talking to as it is for us. But Paul then goes on to say, 
he says, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. So this good news, right, that Paul has, has he said, I proclaim this good news to you. Um, you heard it. You received it. You've been standing in it. That is what is saving you. It's what is bridging the gap between you and God. But it will only be saving you. It's only salvific, we call it, to you if you hold firmly to it. If you compromise and you let things slide or you negotiate or you bargain your faith with the culture and with the world, then you're not going to be standing in the good news of Jesus. You're not. You're standing in some lukewarm puddle of muck, whatever that might be. But it's not the good news of Jesus. So Paul then try, he, he ties this concept not only with the rest of his letter that he's been talking about. Remember, he talked about division, and he talked about sex, and he talked about um, food, and he talked about the gathering of the people. He's talking about now in the resurrection, this next topic. He tied it all into that, and he's tying it into the resurrection as well, saying that you have to stand in the good news of Jesus. That has to be your lens with which you look through everything. And so... He says this, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And he keeps going on. Now the Corinthians were doubting the concept of the resurrection, which is integral to the gospel. Right? Paul says that this is not only important to the entire message, but it's in fact proven. It's witnessed by all these people right? that he not only died publicly, but he rose and appeared publicly to people. He finishes with this. He says, whether then it was I or they, meaning whether it was whether it was Paul that's been proclaiming this or it's Peter or any of the other disciples, whoever it is that is proclaiming this message. He said, so we proclaim, meaning we all have proclaimed it. And so you have come to believe, meaning the message that I've given you is not any different than any of the than the message that any of the other disciples are giving out there or are giving people. And you have, ex- you have come to believe that message. It has not wavered. It has not changed. It is what it is. And you have come to believe it. This, this isn't just his message. It's not just my message. This is the message that God has called for us to hear. And, and it's the message that we see that is consistent through his word as well. And it's the message that we proclaim. So he's saying, whoever is proclaiming this good news, you've come to believe it. So don't waver. Don't be shaky. Don't wash it down. Don't compromise your faith to this world and to this culture. Now, my favorite verse of all time comes from Paul summing this up, summing all this up in his final greetings in chapter 16 and closing this letter. So I'm going to leave this with you as I close. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. It says, keep alert. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and be strong. But I love that he adds this last part. He says, let all that you do be done in love. Amen. Lord, we come before you. We are thankful. We're thankful for the ways that you continue to show your grace and your mercy on us. Lord, we're we're thankful for the gospel message in itself. We ask that you would help us to not let it be a wavering thing on our hearts. But Lord, that you would help us to see it as something that we can stand in. That can be steadfast for us in our lives. That we can rely on and trust in and and, and talk to others about. Lord, that we would actually not just hear this gospel, but receive it. And then take it further and stand in it. And not let it be something that we waver from. So we thank you as we go forth this day, Lord, keep us all safe and bless us as we spend this time with our family and with our friends. We thank you. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Hey, Pastor Jared here. We're glad that you found this video and we hope that God uses it to enrich and grow your life and your walk with Him. We also know that watching videos on YouTube and, and Facebook, it's no substitute for being part of a true community. So we hope that you also find a place of worship, a community that you can be a part of wherever you're at. Uh, if you wanna see what we have in store next on our channel, click here and if you want to see what YouTube thinks you should watch next, click down here. But please remember to subscribe and like our, our video and our page. And we hope to have you watching more in the future.